Warm greetings to all my backstage members. Um, I'm Olga Walker, a Good Cause Travel DMC and Events uh, UK and Ireland. And I'm Alina Schlachtava from Travel Lottery DMC from the United Arab Emirates. And I'm Graham Wilson from Oxford. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hi, Graham. Okay. Um, I was going to introduce Graham as well and say that today we have with us uh, Dr. Graham Wilson, uh, tutor of psychology and coaching at Oxford University and owner of um, a one to one leadership development practice. So, um, after uh, his PhD in behavioral science, uh, Graham worked for 15 years in um, management consultancy, uh, specializing in uh, organization development uh, with a focus on corporate excellence um, specifically and um, training in um, psychotherapy now almost 20 years ago, uh, Graham founded and developed gradually a successful one-to-one uh, -one leadership development practice. Um, all along he's written nine books, uh, received Churchill Fellowship, um, has been traveling regularly to various international conferences to chair them, um, up until now, of course. Um, and has been teaching on various aspects of uh, leadership development. And I would like to add uh, that Graham has kindly agreed to give some of his precious time to my backstage today to try to help us and our audience in the current critical junction for mice and dust due to COVID-19. So we hope that his tremendous experience in the field of uh, leadership development will give us some coping mechanisms for the present and some ideas for the future. Thank you, Graham. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll start with our questions, if it's okay. Um, hospitality events and travel industry um, is going to be affected most of all by COVID-19, um, according to official uh, projections. So it's no doubt that uh, everybody in this industry at the moment suffers from acute anxiety uh, and um, fear for the unknown future. Uh, what would be your recommendations, Graham, uh, of dealing with such feelings and emotions? I think the first thing to say is that anxiety is, is a natural response to situations. Um, it's, it's situations that we can anticipate in the future, so it's always future focused. Um, it's where we believe things are, that we are unable to control things around us. And, uh, and that the possible consequence of that is that we are going to be hurt. So it's a genetically controlled process. Feeling anxiety is a, a natural survival instinct that dates back to when we were, we were um, hunting animals on the plains of Africa. Um, so we can't stop anxiety happening. That's the first thing. Um, everybody experiences it and, and generally it's not a problem. But if anybody is actually got getting to the point where it's been going on for a long time and where it disables them, where they are unable to actually do anything as a result, then they need to go and get clinical help. But for most of us, it, it's actually around those three elements of anticipating things in the future, of being unable to control things around us and having a fear that we're going to be hurt. So we need to tackle those three things if we're going to actually address this sense of anxiety that, that we're getting. Six weeks ago, some people were talking about the, the coronavirus threat as if it was going to be an apocalypse and the end of the world as we know it. And I'm, I'm going to pick up on, on what you were just saying just then because you also were suggesting that this is the end of the conference and, and um, uh, hospitality sector even well come on let's be realistic there are always going to be people who need to um, learn new things about their industry and their sector conferences will continue it's just that they may continue in a very different form so it's not quite as apocalyptic as it might sound that, that there has also been people who've been suggesting that, that coronavirus was the equivalent of the medieval plague. Um, and, and we can smile at that now, but actually they were quite serious just five weeks ago. Um, there were similarly people who were saying, ah, it's gonna be the same as Spanish flu. 
well you know it may be it will do going back to 1918 maybe it will do we don't know there were others who were just saying oh come on it's just a type of cold get over it and that's just five weeks ago now all of those were fantasies they were the psychological interpretation of what they were being presented with anxiety happens when you are taking the extreme end of that and you're not balancing it you're not recognizing that you are being catastrophic in your thinking so what's really important is when we spot ourselves being catastrophic we try and stop it and sometimes that actually means we've got to rely upon somebody else to catch us out because in a household when you're in lockdown and you've maybe only got one other person there it's really easy for the two of you to have this sort of escalating process of catastrophic thinking and that's not going to help anybody so i think the first thing about this anxiety thing is to catch the catastrophe thinking and try and temper it a little bit the second aspect in this is about the ability to control things around us if we're used to being in control which most leaders and entrepreneurs are, mm. then the sense that we can't control things not only disempowers us, but also makes us question our own value, our own worth in a, in a more general sense. And it's that lack of confidence, which is actually what's disabling in anxiety. So what we need to do is to make sure that we continue to get positive affirmations a sense that we're actually okay and we're doing something useful and i mean it's really interesting your mice backstage is a, is a response in that sense you are demonstrating that you're doing something useful and that helps you in your sense of self-worth and your confidence and it's about making sure that all the people around us can get that as well so um one of the best ways of actually feeling more confident about yourself and this might seem strange, is to actually tell other people how much you value them. So if you go out of your way to tell people how important they are to you and how valuable they are, you actually feel better about yourself. And if you think back about it, it, it it's easy to see it. You know, we give somebody a present. We feel good about ourselves for giving them the present. And that's really what we're talking about here. So taking control of things around us is actually about confidence. And the best way of boosting that confidence is to give other people confidence. Um, so that would be my second sort of point in there. And the third thing about this, this anxiety thing is this issue around, I will be hurt. Um, one of the positive outcomes that's come from this lockdown process is that a lot of people have discovered that they can cope with less. Um, we live in a world where possessions and luxuries give us a very false sense of security and and I would say in some parts of the hospitality sector that has been the veneer that we have created for people of giving them a sense of luxury and, 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 and um, importance as a result of that now we have to look at that kind of, of model if you like um, what we're discovering, what lots of people are discovering, is that they don't need those things. Not having them, not using them, not indulging themselves actually does us no harm at all. We haven't suffered. And what's more, will be hurt is a relative term. So a lot of people translate it to mean will be worse off. Or worse still, will be worse off than someone else because they measure their, themselves on some kind of ladder. And so the important thing in here is for us to stop comparing ourselves with other people and see the similarities with them. Now, if we can start to get those three mindsets in place, we're no longer being catastrophic. We're taking control by giving confidence to other people and we're avoiding comparing ourselves with other people. Then that anxiety, that sense of anxiety disappears. So it is a very internal, very personal space and a very personal response to what's going on around us. Mm. Here ended helpful. that lecture. <laughs> oh, no, that's very helpful. So let's move to our second question. 
many people in our industry are asking how to find inner resources in order to come up with plan B in the situation when the crisis happened so quickly and of course without any warning and with no support from the government specific for the industry and this support may not even happen. So plan B may have to be found pretty quickly for many of us. So which strategies would you recommend under such circumstances? Okay. Um, I, I think again, we have to sort of normalize our thinking a little bit. Um, it's very hard to imagine ourselves being creative, which is what we're trying to be, um, when we're actually in what feels like a crisis. Okay. People have lived through far worse crises than this one, and, and they did survive. So we need to be thinking about how are we going to be creative in that kind of way. What we're dealing with here is being strategic. Okay, um, being tactical is just tinkering. We, we know that we are in a difficult crisis. We know that the, the, um, uh, the, the projections for the future are not looking great, but we have to, we therefore have to behave strategically, not tactically. So doing little things is unlikely to be effective. So how do we think strategically? The first thing is that we've got to keep an open mind we, we have to stop stop using terms like must, should, have to, says he, having just used the have to. We need to try and move that into a different kind of space. We need to be open-minded about what the possibilities are. So that's the first thing, be open-minded. The, the second one is about being informed. Um, we, a lot of us, build up a bank of data, a bank of knowledge, and we rely upon that day to day for our decision making. What has happened is that the bank of that knowledge has become suddenly turned upside down. Some of it is still relevant, some of it is very not relevant. And we therefore need to make sure that we are being informed. And, and that is about the big picture stuff, not the little detail, but the big picture. So we need to make sure that we're looking longer term and we're getting the right data coming into us. The third thing is that we need to engage with other people. Um, effective leaders always have a wide network and they always have an inner group, an inner cadre of, of um, confidants, if you like. Some of those people will be in their industry, others will be outside it, but they all have a lot to offer. And so my challenge to a lot of, of leaders in that kind of position is to actually just pick up the phone and talk to the individuals who they in the past have networked with and have got some kind of sense of, of connection to. Um, every person that you pick up in this current crisis will relish the opportunity to talk to you about where they're at and what's going on. They, they're they're going to be just as isolated as us. So pick up the phone and have that conversation. Um, I actually had a call yesterday from a, a fairly senior leader in a charity who I had never met, never spoken to before. He looked up, looked through his LinkedIn contacts. He came to my name. He said, oh, that guy looks like he might be interesting to have a chat to. He rang me up. We spent 20 minutes on the phone and I would like to believe that we both got something really useful out of that 20 minute conversation. So be prepared to pick up the phone and talk to people. Um, really important that we're engaging with others. And then the fourth thing in my, my list would be um, around communication, by which I really mean communicating with the people that you depend upon in your, your chain of delivery, if you like. If you're one big organisation, then it's going to be your executives, your staff, um, other employees. If you're a one-person organisation, it's going to be your main suppliers. Um, just as much as your main customers. So try and think about communicating with those groups of people. Um, the best ideas always come from the people that you um, have closest to something. Um, it, it isn't people who can take an outside view, it's actually the people who are doing something. And if you're not communicating with them, you're not gonna get the answers to problems because they've been worrying about these things too. So the important thing here is communication in that chain of, of people, if you like. Um, but that, important, that, that communication has to be done in, an, in the right kind of way. 
Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been blogging about two individuals in particular. Um, there is one who's obviously a fairly household name. Um, she's Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister from New Zealand. Um, she has been getting international acclaim because each day she has a chat with the entire population of her country. And the chats are relaxed, they are informal, they are honest, and they are hugely empathic. She really understands what they're going through and is trying to put herself through the same experience so that she can resonate with them. And they pick that up and they absolutely love it. It's extraordinary. On a, on a smaller scale, um, at the University of Oxford, we've got a Vice Chancellor, Louise Richardson. She's been sending out weekly messages to every employee in the organization. They are grounded, they're very straightforward, they are as honest as she can be. She admits where there are things that she doesn't have any answers for them. And in every case, she is empathizing with the people. She is trying to put herself in, in our position as employees. So that empathy, that ability to empathize in your communication is really important. And when people feel that you understand them, then they're not going to be frightened to come forward with ideas and suggestions and thoughts that could be really important to you. So I think from my mind, just to quickly capture all of that, I think that this is about creativity. It is about thinking strategically rather than tactically. It's about keeping an open mind, about being informed, about engaging with other people and about communicating. Thank you. Thank you. But talking about creativity, um, it's um, um, rather hard to exercise um, creativity um, in chaotic environment. And uh, let's face it that all of us at the moment live in chaotic environment. Uh, we have to juggle uh, looking after children, homeschooling them, being stuck in four walls 24-7, um, uh, all the while trying to work remotely, saving our business, learning new online technologies, um, and dealing with a huge influx of information uh, from outside, uh, news, social media, and so on and so forth. So I suppose our, our next question would be, what would be your recommendations on how to keep a clear mind um, in such circumstances, which is necessary for creativity and for um, moving forward? I, I totally get the, get the, the question, I think. Um, <laughs> I will try and avoid giving you a mini lecture on this one. I, I actually think that there's three really important things that we can do. Um, the first one is news unfolds on a daily basis. Um, up until relatively recently, everything was geared around the newspaper's deadline for publication. And so um, it, it had to work on a daily basis. Uh, we seem to have got ourselves into a position now where we expect it to be happening every minute of the day. Um, I think we need to, to, to pull back from that a little bit. There is a natural cycle to it. Um, and so if you're somebody who sits with the app on your phone, pinging every second that a new headline comes out, um, I strongly suggest that you turn it off. Um, you simply don't need to keep checking the news that often. Um, you know, do it when you wake up in the morning and then forget about it, okay? You'll catch the next headline the following morning. So that would be the first thing. The second thing I think is to keep to text-based media rather than audiovisual and TV. Um, my reason behind that is that audiovisual news is geared to providing excitement and a minimal insight. And so that's not going to be really very helpful to you in getting a good overview for, for your work. So concentrate on the informed, concentrate on in-depth analysis, Choose a channel that you trust, whatever your particular leanings are. Um, most news channels are clearly biased. We know who their owner is and we know what the influence is that they exert upon the editorial content. So for goodness sake, pick one that's independent, even if it is leaning towards your way of thinking or your, your worldview. Be selective, but stick to the text-based version, not necessarily printed, but on web pages or whatever 
but but don't get wound up in the must watch the latest clip um which so many of the channels and the social media channels are throwing at us all the moment all the time at the moment so that'd be the, the second point and then the third one is that the media have have been incredibly keen to spread doom and gloom about coronavirus <laughs> um it's just unbelievable almost um and yet life actually is going on outside this stuff it's just that they have pushed all of that to another page on their websites and it can take quite a bit of digging but sooner or later you will find a page on almost every newspaper where they have got the other non-coronavirus news <laughs> and what i strongly suggest to people is that they bookmark that page, have it on their own browser, and then just go to that. And if you really want to catch up on coronavirus, which is understandable, but, but just choose to do it rather than taking the big stuff that's being thrown at you. Mm. So there we go. Um, get to a daily basis, stick to text and informed insight rather than headline, no, headline notes. Um, and and try and find the non doom and gloom pages of the newspaper. Thank you very much. Somehow I have done uh, part of your recommendations already. At least I knew some notifications because I felt that I'm going crazy with all of that. Thank you very much for your time and for your um, experience. And have you got anything to wish to my backstage audience? Thank you. Well, I, I think I go back to something that I said right at the outset. I think it is easy for us to get tied up in a, in a catastrophic picture. But at the end of the day, human beings in every industry want to connect with one another. And the secret for, for the MICE industry sector is to find out how they're going to do that and be, be the first people in the market. Great. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank really you. Okay. Time and recommendations. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck for you too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.